Hello and welcome to episode 8 of Opera Vision's Next Generation series. I'm Nina Brazier, a stage director based in Frankfurt, and over this series we've been diving into four European Young Artist programmes, exploring how the opera world is developing and nurturing the next generation of talent. From Opera for Peace to the Academia Rossiniana at the Rossini Opera Festival to the Palau de les Arts in Valencia and the Opera Studio at Oper Frankfurt. We have backstage access to masterclasses, concerts, rehearsal spaces and dressing rooms to find out how the singers negotiate the physical and emotional highs and lows while exploring their unique operatic voice. Over the next couple of episodes, we're having deeper conversations with some young artists, experts and alumni. And today, we're with the Palau de les Arts, Centre de Perfectionnement in Valencia, chatting to their young artist soprano, Iria Gotti, who you'll remember from previous episodes, alongside the soprano, Angel Blue, who needs no introduction to opera lovers, alumna of the Young Artists Programme, at the Centre de Perfectionnement. Today we'll be hearing how Iria uses self-criticism to develop and improve her performance, how Angel works through feelings of comparison and competition, and what happens next when fear takes hold at a public performance. As always, let's hear a couple of opening words from our two guests. I don't want other people to decide for me how I feel about myself and how I feel about others around me. When it comes to our thoughts, it's incredibly important to make sure that we surround ourselves with people who are, of course, honest with us. We don't, you know, I don't want to be lied to, but I also want the criticism that I receive to be constructive and something that's going to help me, not hurt me. The repertoire was beautiful, but a bit difficult for me because it, it was it was a challenge. I mean, I'm I'm still working on my vocal technique. And especially my high notes. <laughs> so I was thinking all the time, okay, you have to be, get there because you've been working on it. And you you did it before and it was nice and it was better. So you can do it, you can do it, you can do it. And and I believe that that same thought that you can do it, you can do it, that pressure I put on myself was what created the fear in the process. Iria and I caught up from her home in Valencia and mine in Frankfurt. Firstly, I wanted to know why she's changed her surname since we last spoke. I'm really happy with my name. I think it's different and I really like it. But at the same time, I wanted to have uh, an artistic name. So all my life, I liked a lot my grandmother's surname. So I chose that to my artistic name and now it's Iria Gotti. It's been six months since Iria first started on the Young Artist Programme. What's the biggest thing that's changed in that time? Everything. I mean, I'm a different person. Oh, <laughs> my life changed. I'm, I was in an academic um, world before this. And it's still academic and I'm still learning and I'm still doing a process and, and improving. But at the same time, I'm in a theatre working and singing and and the audience comes to see my performances, so it's pretty nice. <laughs> I've been lucky enough to interview Angel before for my podcast, The Opera Pod. We spoke once again on the line between her performances of Violetta in La Traviata at the Metropolitan Opera in New York. I'm in my study. It's a very cozy area where I have, um, I like rugs, so I, I, have a, I have a very nice collection of uh, different kinds of rugs. So I have a very long rug in my study that's on the floor. It helps to dampen the sound a little bit when I'm singing in here. And it's very soft and beautiful. I'm actually rubbing my feet on it right now. <laughs> I'm sitting at my piano, um, sitting at my piano and the next to my piano are a ton of pictures of my favorite singers, mainly my dad and Leontine Price and Renee Fleming. <laughs> and then I have... Um, Next to that is a beautiful uh, drape that I have that matches uh, my rug. So I'm, I'm just in my little, as I call it, my, my angel cave. 
Oh, it sounds absolutely gorgeous and so cosy. And I would love to take us right back to your early time as a young artist. I'm thinking about Angel Blue when she stepped off the plane and first arrived in Valencia. What were you like? How would you describe <laughs> yourself back then? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, I was. I, there were so many words to describe that the feeling that I had when I arrived in Valencia. I'd say the first one was hopeful and what I remember specifically about getting off of the plane, the the main thing was, I, I hope I can do this. But I felt very hopeful. I felt very excited and, of course, very nervous. But um, I was thrilled to be there. And I still, to this day, I, I often say that I owe having an opera career to Europe because I, I started there. And had I not had the experience in Hungary, uh, that was the first country I visited, but had I not had the experience in Hungary with Operalia and then uh, Valencia and Spain, singing all over Spain, Madrid and uh, Orviedo and so many other places, um, Barcelona, Malaga, all of those places. Had I not done that, I don't know that I would be uh, where I am today. Iria has recently finished her first young artist production, Cendrillon by Viardot. What was the most challenging thing about rehearsals? In the opera, I was one of Cinderella, stepsisters. I believe my character was a bit crazy and definitely over the top. <laughs> and not the best sister to Cinderella. <laughs> um, my part in the opera was trying all the time to get the prince and the crown for myself <laughs> and to be mean to her. And the most challenging thing, maybe doing comedy and make it realistic because I'm comfortable with drama and sadness and all the bad things and the bad emotions, but actually doing comedy, it's, it's tough sometimes <laughs> because you, you have to make it realistic. But at the same time, because my, my character was over the top all the time, it took me some time to uh, find the balance and the middle point on that. Was it a struggle for you thinking about having to be playing over the top all the time in a, in a fun way and in a comedic way? Is it difficult to get that sort of heightened level of emotion? Because I imagine that must be very tiring. Yes, it is. And at the, at the beginning, it, it was it was hard. I mean, it was, I was focused all the time, like, okay, you have to be over the top, but you have to be really extra with with your your voice. But at the same time, I with the weeks going on, <laughs> I found that I really like it. <laughs> I like it to be over the top, <laughs> and and the character was not far from who I am. <laughs> I mean, that's funny that you say that because you're talking about how mean she has to be to Cinderella and <laughs> trying to steal the prince. In what way? Tell us in what way she's close to, to who you are. I'm curious. Uh, because I really like to make people laugh. Hearing my colleagues laughing at the screaming or, or something and they were laughing and, and, and my feeling was like, OK, I'm doing something right. <laughs> my colleagues were really nice and talented, obviously. <laughs> and the work process was super fun. I have to be honest, it was super fun and we created a really good team and a safe space. We were all learning and, and improving through the process of creating the the production and, and it was it was really nice. I mean, it was really comfortable to work there. Angel is at the peak of an extraordinary career, but she always knew from a really young age that she wanted to be an international opera singer. How did she envisage that life? I think it was less about the roles and more about traveling. When I think about being an international opera singer, my dad used to tell me when I was younger, when I, I only had my father for 23 years. And when I was probably around, I guess, 18 or 19, my dad started telling me that my talent would take me around the world. And I, I was actually, it's a very specific um, time when I said I want to be an international opera singer. And I was in college and I was with a group of singers. We were all about junior, senior year of college. So that would put us about 20, 21 years old. And I remember so many of the singers in my opera workshop class had done programs, summer programs overseas. And they had been to these great places like Graz, Austria and Salzburg, Austria and Germany and France and all of these 
amazing European places and Spoleto Festival in Italy and all of this. And I, I could only dream of traveling there. I'm from a very small town in California. Most people say that I'm from Los Angeles, which isn't a lie, but I grew up in LA, but also in a town called Apple Valley. And one of my biggest dreams was to just see the world. I wanted to, you know, you in school, we studied all of these places, all of these um, great monuments and such. And I, I remember specifically re, um, studying the seven wonders of the world and just thinking to myself, gosh, I would love to travel one day to sing in some of these places and to to visit these places. So for me, the the, the international opera career was something that would give me the opportunity to get outside of and it wasn't so much even just the United States. It was leaving California. I wanted to see what else was there. So it opened up when I started singing professionally. But what I did do when I was 26 years old, right before I went to Operalia, I did take a page of paper and I wrote out a schedule for myself. And it was like 10 different countries in one season. And uh, that sh- that shortly became uh, <laughs> my my reality about maybe two years after that. Like, I think it's very important to to have a very strong idea of what we want. And sometimes we don't know what we want exactly. But I know for myself, it helps me to really sort of like v- visualize and understand better what it is that I want when I'm when I've written it down. But no matter how early one begins. Competition and comparison are almost certainly going to come up. I asked Iria. As we all know, to get onto a Young Artist Programme, there's a huge amount of competition. And you had, in this experience, a lovely feeling of camaraderie, as as you're explaining. And I'm wondering, how does it feel once you're settled into the programme or into a production like this? Do you still feel like you're competing with your colleagues? You're aware all the time that there are people... Mm -hmm. colleagues that have the same voice type that you have and they could do the same role you're doing but at the same time because we are all in the same position we understand each other so we are nice to each other and we support each other all the time I believe we are lucky to have created a good group for that about her relationship with the competitive nature of the opera industry. Comparison is the thief of joy. It's not going to make anybody happy. I, I try as hard as I can not to compare myself because it actually doesn't make sense. The more and more I've, I've thought about comparing myself to people, it's like, actually, you can't really say, oh, this person sings this role. I sing this role. We don't sing it the same. Well, why would you? You don't have the same life experiences. You don't have the same parents. You don't have the same upbringing. You're not from the same country. You're not, you know what I mean? There's a million things that go on the lists of why we're different. <laughs> why, why, you know, why, why would people compare Collis to Tibaldi? Two very, very different lives. Whenever I see that or feel like I'm starting to compare myself to someone else, I, I, I truly start thinking about my dad and my upbringing. I was raised um, in the church and I was playing the bass guitar in church and in a family band. And I just start thinking about the things that are unique to me and my experience. And it usually really helps me to get off of that comparison train. It it really isn't, it's not helpful. And I'm not trying to speak against social media because I actually think social media is a great tool. Um, You know, when it's used in a positive way, it's a wonderful thing. 
But I, I do find that when I had social media, I would look at other singers and see what they were doing. And I would try to be happy for them. I, I, I feel like I learned that when I did beauty pageants, I tried to be happy for the, the other contestants, for the other girls who were competing. And I try to do the same thing today to be happy for people when I find out, oh, this person is singing, you know, um, I don't know, this person singing Mimi at La Scala and how awesome for them. That's great. I think at times it's difficult because we are bombarded, or at least I felt this, this way, uh, bombarded with so much information, especially online with how people are doing, what they're doing uh, and how frequently they're doing it. There are, of course, multiple pressures to deal with on and off stage. How does Iria deal with knowing that each performance could be pivotal? I was chatting with Alejandro in the last of our episodes and he was telling me that the intendant of the Teatro Real saw him singing the role of Sam in Trouble in Tahiti and he got a role in Madrid at the Teatro Real soon afterwards. And I'm thinking... When you're playing your role, such as in Cendrillon, do you feel the pressure in those performances to prove yourself as you never know who might be sitting watching? A little bit. All performances are important and I, tr and I try to do my best in each of them. But at the same time, because I want to enjoy them, <laughs> I try to convince myself that uh, one performance only does not define everything and does not define who I am as a singer or as an artist. But yeah, you definitely think, mm, who might be watching today? Um, <laughs> but I try to keep calm and, and enjoy every performance because every performance is different and you never know. Are you able in that moment to just be caught up in the drama and disconnect in a way from thinking, okay, who are the eyes watching? Who are the eyes watching me at the moment? Yeah, when I'm on stage, yeah. Maybe the, the moments that I outside the stage to wait for my next entrance and things like that. Maybe in that moment I start I, I start thinking, okay, I did that and I didn't really like that. But once I got in into the stage again, it's gone. So I'm I'm really yeah. happy and proud of it because I don't think it's an easy thing to do. It's it's funny because it only happens when I'm doing opera. When I'm doing recitals, I'm thinking all the time. <laughs> but when I'm doing opera, Maybe because I'm active too and, and, and trying to focus a lot on of what I'm doing and where I have to be on stage and who I'm talking to or those things. I'm more focused and I'm able to enjoy it. And that's so interesting hearing about the moments where you step off the stage and you immediately start critiquing your own performance. Yeah. We're so harsh on ourselves, aren't we? How, how do you manage in those moments before you next step onto the stage to put those feelings aside and step back on the stage into the reality of the drama that you're in? Mm, I try to think about what's next in the action, like getting me into the character again and into the drama of, of it. And just be quiet in my mind. <laughs> yeah, it's so hard, isn't it? Yeah. And I was thinking about those criticisms that you're that you're thinking of in those moments, say on the side stage. How do you use those those criticisms of yourself in perhaps a useful way? Does each performance start afresh, and you give yourself a new critique, or are they things that you think I need to remember for the next performance to change? Yeah, definitely. I take mind notes <laughs> about the things I want to change. I try to not listen to the not useful thoughts because I always have them like, okay, I, I just did that and it was a mess and then next time it's going to be worse. No, that's not it. <laughs> I try to think what I can do better in the next performance, uh, take some notes about some specific points in the opera and keep that in mind for, for the next performance and, and that's it. It's not easy sometimes when you have a, a not good performance. It's it's difficult because you are nervous and, and the fear, it's a really powerful emotion. But at the same time, I really love what I do when I'm on stage. So I try to focus on that and, and keep that in mind all the time. Thinking about that self-criticism that we all experience, I asked Angel how she handles her inner critic. It's hard. It's it's very hard. It's not um, it's not an easy thing. I don't think that people are wired to think positively. I think we're wired to go 
almost immediately to whatever it is that's negative. I stopped reading reviews in 2010. I was singing Micaela and Carmen at the Palau de las Arts in Valencia, where I was a young artist. And I read a review and the review made me, I was so uncomfortable after I read it. It wasn't obviously, it wasn't a, a favorable review. So after I read it, it completely changed my mind and my ideas, my thoughts about myself. I, I don't like that. I'm a very strong, I'm sure you can tell by talking to me, I'm a very strong-willed person. My mom used to say, she said, Angel, you're so headstrong. And she said, but we have to make sure that we're putting this headstrong in the right direction and in the right way, using it the right way. And I don't want other people to decide for me how I feel about myself and how I feel about others around me. Does that make sense? Totally. It's it's resonating so strongly with me. Yes. And so as an artist, I feel the same way. You know, I know I've, I know my voice. I know my voice better than anybody else because I'm me. I think when it comes to our thoughts, it's incredibly important to make sure that we surround ourselves with people who are of course, honest with us. We don't, you know, I don't want to be lied to, but I also want the criticism that I receive to be constructive and something that's going to help me, not hurt me. There's a verse in the Bible that says you will know them by their fruit. What is the meaning behind what someone is saying to you? What is the meaning behind what you're saying to yourself? You know, I I had a performance of La Traviata the other day and I really didn't feel like I sang my best. Um, I was tired. You know, I have a, I have an 11 year old who's about to turn 12. He's my stepson, but you know, I'm full-time stepmom over here. And I was tired. I had to take him into school that day. Then my husband needed me to do some things for him that day. And I'm thinking, gosh, you have a performance. Just try to keep yourself as positive as you can throughout the day. But with all of the things that surround us, all of the noise, all of the, you know, the I suppose we could call it stress and just life, all of the things that happen, it is our duty, or at least I feel for myself. It is my duty to make sure that I maintain the things that that are going to uplift me. And really, they uplift not just me, but they uplift those around me, you know, and and there's something to really be said about um, about keeping our thoughts noble and just and, you know, meditating on things that are pure and things that are lovely, things that are of good report. That's actually uh, found in Philippians chapter four. So I, I don't know. I suppose that You know, some people might say, oh, that's just being super optimistic. But I don't know that being too optimistic is is a bad thing. Of course, you know, reality is there always. But I I do believe that optimism and being a positive person and trying to see good in, in things. I think it's what's helped me probably the most in the last 10 years in terms of my singing and dealing with people in the business and all of that. It's it's a long winded way to say that it's just important to stay positive. (laughs) this performance of La Traviata, you weren't feeling your you weren't feeling your best self. Do you manage at the end of the show, do you manage not to criticize yourself and beat yourself up because you think you haven't, you know, performed your absolute best? I know, I know that I'm I'm not 100 percent all of the time. And I don't know anyone who is. 
And so why does opera need to be perfect? Why is it that every time I stand up on, I'm just going to be real really quickly, you know, woman to woman here. I mean, if I'm on my period, you're going to get a totally different Violetta uh, than, <laughs> than if I'm not, you know, yeah. if I, I'm, I pardon me for being so blunt with no, that, but it is, I have a condition called endometriosis and adenomyosis. And, uh, and that's, it's, I have a very, very difficult time when I'm uh, menstruating. Most people don't know that a woman can be in incredibly excruciating pain. And if I'm giving a performance at that time, it's very hard. But I get that I'm imperfect. I get that I'm not, I'm not a machine. I'm not, you know, a great recording from the 50s <laughs> that we've all listened to <laughs> of, you know, Kala singing these roles, this role specifically, Traviata at La Scala, you know, and who knows what she was going through at that time. But it's a fabulous recording. I mean, I look at it as it's, it's life. Sometimes I have great days. And sometimes I have not so great days. And if it's that I've had a very busy day with family, um, like I did the other day before I had to sing, but that's life. And that's yeah. what we sing about is real life. And then there's the dreaded stage fright. Is fear something that Iria is still battling with? Yeah, actually, last week <laughs> we had a recital and, and I was feeling really nervous. And I had fear because I had to sing a difficult duet with a colleague. And because of that fear, it, it, didn't, work, it didn't go well. It wasn't a mess, obviously. But it didn't go well, and and after afterwards, I was feeling a bit overwhelmed with myself because I was aware that I had, I did that to myself. It didn't go well because <laughs> I had these thoughts, these negative thoughts about it, and I didn't let myself enjoy the performance. So yeah, definitely, sometimes it's it's hard. It's not easy to deal with. It's a process and I'm learning and, and I try to not push myself all the time. Yeah, that sounds like a really tough experience. And do you think, do you think in that way, what would you do differently if that situation came up again and you could feel those nerves kicking in again in a way that might affect your performance? Brace <laughs> and yeah. distract myself. Talk to a colleague or, or try to focus on another theme. I'm still trying to find what can I do to, to fix this Moments. Iria's current challenge is Baroque music, as she's covering Amore and Valletta in La Coronazione di Popea. How's that going? I believe that I had a wrong idea about what is to sing Baroque music. I had this idea that it's like no vibrato, plain sound. And, and it's not. We have, uh, we've been working from the last, this month with a uh, musical director. I've learned that it's a, it's different. It's a different language, but it's still music and, and it's really beautiful. I've been feeling more and more comfortable comfortable with it because at, at the beginning it felt really far from myself. I had a rough time trying to connect with the music, but now I've been working on the role and it's really beautiful and really nice and. Yeah, it's like it's a learning a new language. At the beginning, it's confusing, but after that, you feel that you can communicate yourself and it feels nice. Now, I'm going to bring us on to the question that I like to ask all my guests. What do you think we can do to make the opera world a better place? Music and, and art, is it's a complex world and, and it's really beautiful and we all enjoy it a lot. But at the same time, it's a rough path for artists but the main thing for me is to create an inclusive and respectful space for everyone and what about angel what does she think we can do oh we have to love each other nina we must love each other we must care for each other people come to us to escape what's happening in their lives i go to opera to escape what's happening in mine and to enjoy, you know, make-believe. But in that make-believe, there is some truth, you know, there, and there is, I'm singing Traviata right now, and there is truth in the story of Violetta. But I feel that it's, it's my responsibility to love my neighbor as myself. I want to treat my fellow artist the way that I want to be treated. And if we aren't able to do that, what do we have? Then what is art? 
Thank you so much to Iria Gotti and Angel Blue for joining me today on Opera Vision, and thanks to you for listening. There's plenty more online at operavision.eu, where you can see Iria in Cendrillon by Viardot in the performance from the Palau de les Arts, the Opera Studio Soiree with young artists from Oper Frankfurt, directed for the screen by me and Anske Mattison. I'll link to all those in the show notes and give details on all the other music extracts you heard in this episode. We'll be back with the Rossini Opera Festival's Accademia Rossiniana on Monday, the 1st of May. This series is edited and produced by Karen Piri and curated and hosted by me, Nina Brazier. Opera Vision is co-funded by the European Commission. Music